Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Kingdom Marriage Show with Asani and Danielle. We are thrilled to be doing this show with you where we are going to go deep and talk about what is a kingdom marriage. What are we talking about when we say kingdom marriage? You hear it all the time. You're hearing it all over social media, on YouTube, on Facebook, on Instagram, everywhere you turn, you're hearing somebody use that term kingdom. Well, we want to go deep and we want to give you a roadmap so that you can understand what it means to live and walk out that kingdom marriage. So Hassani, I want you to just start us off with a word of prayer. Let's do that. All right. We always touch and agree. So Father God, we thank you for this show. We thank you for using us as your vessels, your instruments, and your conduits from which your message would flow. We pray that every word spoken today will be a seed planted into the hearts and the minds of every listener every viewer and we pray that that seed will uh, germinate and grow and produce a harvest of change and transformation that through this we become uh, aware of who you are and the purpose and the power of our relationships that we may fulfill the calling that you have upon our lives so we thank you for what you're going to do uh, and father okay. yes and we thank you father god that you would just spread your hedge of protection around every couple that is joining us to listen in on this show because we know that this is going to change and transform the way couples Couples do marriage, Lord. We are tired of being under the thumb of what the world is saying and confused and lost and dismayed. And so we're thanking you, Father God, for protection, that everyone that joins in, that the word will go in and that those seeds will be planted and that they will develop into seeds that will create harvest that will last for a generation. So we thank you in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So in order to really dig in deep, we have to go back to the original definition of what a kingdom marriage is because we're going to spend the next few weeks kind of unpacking it in detail. So if you remember, a kingdom marriage is defined as a covenantal union between a man and a woman who commit themselves to function in unison under divine authority in order to replicate God's image and expand his rule in the world through both their individual and joint callings. There's a whole lot there. There is a but, lot there. But, it's but, exciting. It is exciting. But what we're going to do today is really zone in on that first piece and unpack what a covenant actually is. I think it's important that we understand that, right? Because if we understand that going into marriage is so much more than a contract, which is all we really focus on, mm. you know, we go get our marriage license and we do the things legally that we're supposed to do. But when God established marriage, he actually established a covenant, a threefold covenant between you, your partner and God. And so the definition of a covenant is a covenant covenant is an unchangeable sacred agreement between God and his children. God sets specific conditions and he promises to bless us as we obey these conditions. Making and keeping covenants qualifies us to receive the blessings God has promised. When we choose not to keep covenants, we cannot receive the blessing. And so covenants are serious. God means business when he establishes a covenant with us. You know what? So as you read that, two things stuck out. God has his role and we have our role. So the promise comes from God, but it requires obedience on our part. And if we obey what God is telling us to do, then the promise will be given to us. So it's not a unilateral, but a bilateral covenant where we both have a responsibility. And so all the benefits and the perks and the blessings and all those things can be ours in our marriage if we honor the system that he ultimately right. put in place. And so when we think about about a marriage covenant, we got to realize that in a larger scope, covenants have been established all throughout the Bible. There's an incalculable number of covenants. Now, some of the ones that we're most familiar with, we could just, you know, reference a few. There was the covenant that was established first in Eden, in the Garden of Eden, when God promised that we would have dominion over the earth. So, so in the Garden of Eden, God clearly told us that he wanted us to be fruitful, to multiply, to replenish the earth, to subdue it. And as a result of that, dominion would come. Now, look, can we just pause on that real quick? Because there's so much in that. Um, you know, when we're talking about being fruitful, what it, look, think about what that means, because you can't be fruitful. Mm -hmm 
miracle without sowing the proper seeds in the proper soil. And I think that one of the biggest issues is that we we do not know how to be fruitful and to dominate as it relates to relationship. We just don't. We're doing things the world's way. When you think mm-hmm. about being fruitful, you think about planting these seeds and getting a harvest and you're you got a harvest over here, you got a harvest with your children, you got a harvest in legacy, you got a harvest with between you and your spouse. But mm-hmm. oftentimes we're not seeing a harvest. Our our garden is rotten. You know, our garden is overridden because there's too much worldly influence that we've invited into our marriages that never applied. That if you're in the kingdom, if you're a child of God, there are certain things that you've been planting in the garden of your relationship that doesn't belong in this soil. And that is why you're not fruitful. That's why you're not seeing the harvest that you need to see. Absolutely. But then you have the the, the covenant that God established with Noah, right? And that covenant was that he would never destroy the earth again through water. And the sign of that covenant was a rainbow. So every time we see a rainbow, no matter where we are, and I remember being in Costa Rica, we would see rainbows all the time but rainbows are all over the planet and it is a sign that god honors his word yeah i mean when i see a rainbow it's it's very hopeful it's a beautiful thing to see but it is the reminder now the world is always trying to change the meaning of everything now no longer let me just back up a little bit and just say that we have to remember (laughs) what god said and we can't remember what god said if we never knew it in the first place or we don't read our word okay the rainbow is a covenant between man and god it is his promise that he will never destroy the earth that way let's be clear right by water by water (laughs) again he didn't say he'll never destroy it again he said i will never destroy it by water again so when we look at the rainbow we need to reject these crazy mental constructs that we have that have changed the meaning of the rainbow. It is a covenant and it is a promise that God will not do what he, and and the beautiful thing about it is that when you can look at the rainbow in the sky, then it gives you the faith that you need to know that, wow, covenants are real. Like when God makes a covenant, he means it. He established a rainbow in the sc- in the clouds. It says it in his word. And I am a witness That's right. to what I'm seeing in the word. Uh, another type of covenant that many of us are familiar with would be the Abrahamic covenant. That was a covenant that he established with Abraham, that he would be the father of many, many nations for generations and generations to come. So what's interesting is that when God establishes a covenant with man, it's not just with that man, but it's for the descendants as well, which we'll get in a little bit later. But that was a huge, huge covenant. Right. And if you if you think about it, you know, you could go through the lineage and, and the Bible does a good job of breaking down the lineage um, all in the beginning of, in Genesis. You can see who begat who begat who. Um, but historically, there has been a lost tribes. Yeah. There, there are lost tribes. Right. But we know that we are descendants of those tribes. And so it is a, a covenant that you can actually see all the different nations all around the world all started from a few people. Absolutely. Time. So you can see that covenant again. Another example of how when God says something, it just is. That's right. It doesn't matter how long it's been. Another another covenant that God established was the covenant that he made with with Moses. And that was that Israel would be a holy nation. Now, when we're talking about Israel, we're not talking about the state of Israel, but we're talking about the people of Israel. You just spoke to the lost tribes. And so they've been scattered all over the world. But God said, if we would obey, that there would be blessings that would rain down from heaven. And we are of those tribes. And so he's talking to us. So in essence, we can go all the way back to the very beginning and see ourselves and see our significance in the word of God. The next big covenant is the covenant that God established with David. And that is that there would be an eternal kingdom that would come from the line of David. And going back to that genealogy that you just spoke of, we can actually see how it plays itself out even today. So so once again, these are eternal covenants. And now the final covenant, which most of us are familiar with, is the covenant that was made between Jesus Christ and all of us who have accepted Jesus Christ, which is the forgiveness of sins through the shedding of his blood. Now we're most familiar with that um, and we've accepted that but somehow we lose the uh, it loses the efficacy when we start thinking about all these other covenants so when we think about how powerful that covenant is with Jesus Christ it literally links me to my salvation it links me to my eternal resting place and I hold on to that near and dear 
The same power exists in every other covenant because it is an everlasting covenant. Every covenant is from the beginning to the end. It never ends. And and that term everlasting, that is the most significant um, characteristic of a covenant because in addition to the ones that we just went through, I mean, the Bible really unpacks, you know, relationships that he's established with man built around this covenant. Some of them were conditional and some of them were unconditional, but they were forever. They were everlasting. They went beyond the one that he established a covenant with. It went to their children and their children's children and generations to come. So while we get to benefit from all of the uh, covenants that were established in the world, Word, it leads and lays a foundation for this thing called a marital covenant. Right. We're really excited about Foundation. It is a new group program where couples are gathering from all around the world twice a week. Couples who just want to have a thriving, successful, amazing marriage. No really well-built house is built without a foundation. As a matter of fact, without a foundation, it can't stand. It would just crumble right into the ground. We are going to interview experts and other successful couples so that you can get a glimpse into the lives of other people who are doing what it is that you desire to do, who have and who are accomplishing what it is that you want to accomplish. And we also have over 500 videos available for you to watch of all of our teaching, everything that we've ever done, every topic that we've ever covered will be accessible to you. So guys, if this sounds exciting to you and if this sounds like something you've been waiting for, go ahead and just give it a try. We're literally giving away a 15 day trial for a dollar. And then after that, it's simply three bucks a day. And so is your marriage worth it? Is your future worth it? Join the community today. Just click that button and meet us on the other side. I want you to get your pen and paper out because I want you to understand what are some of the benefits of being obedient to the covenant? Because Sasani, at the end of the day, we have to get used to taking ourselves out of the equation. And I know that seems conflicting to many people because we live in a society where it's all about you. It's all about how you feel. Just do it. If you feel it, then it's right. If it's, it, you know, it's your choice, it's your right. Whatever you say goes. That's not what God says, okay? When he establishes something, it's his way. It's what he says. And you benefit by being in alignment with, with what God has established. So I want to just drop a few benefits to getting into alignment with God's covenants. Number one, supernatural increase and promotion. Number two, restoration of all the enemy has stolen. Number three, honor in the midst of adversaries. Number four, increased assets. Number five, greater victories in the midst of greater odds or impossibilities. Number six, recognition even when I seem to be the least likely to receive it. Number seven, prominence and preferential treatment. Number eight, petitions granted even by ungodly civil authorities. Number nine, policies, rules, regulations, laws changed to my advantage. Number 10, battles won. I won't have to fight because God fights for me. So folks, there are benefits to getting in alignment with what God has established. And there is no greater power than stepping into the authority that God has given us through the obedience of what he's established. So now that that phenomenal foundation has been laid, now let's dive into what a marital covenant looks like. So whenever God established any type of covenant with man, the term cutting a covenant was used. To cut a covenant means that there had to be a death something in essence had to die. So typically an animal would be sacrificed and that animal would be cut in half. 
And through the cutting of that animal, there will be a shedding of blood. And one part of that animal will be placed on one side of a path, and the other part of the animal will be placed on the other side of a path. And so that man or that person would have to walk through the bloody path of that dead animal. And so the reality is, once that was done, the covenant was established. Now, that was actually done physically. Now, when we bring it into the realm of marriage, we see some Something that actually takes place. In fact, we even find in the book of Hebrews an explanation of what this covenant looks like. In Hebrews, the ninth chapter, the 16th through the 17th verse, it says, For where a covenant is, there must of necessity be the death of the ones who made it. For a covenant is valid only when men are dead, for it is never enforced while the ones who made it lives. So from a marital perspective, when two people come together and give their vows and enter into a covenant what do you mean there has to be the death of the ones who made it so that means that the husband and the wife have to die yes essentially it's the death of your oneness and your individuality that's what dies and people i talk about this a lot about how we really don't recognize how selfish we are until we get married and have children we really don't know that we're very selfish i mean think about when we're born into this world we're born into the world selfish we're not born into the world giving mm -hmm. right we're born into the world taking a baby needs right they're not independent they need you to support them to feed them to take care of them and we're raised like that and yeah. so it's not until we go down the aisle and get married and maybe about three months in it slaps us in the face oh snap it's not all about me so there is a death of your oneness that has to take place and that means that the two are now becoming one so no no longer are you an individual doing life alone now you are two becoming one and that goes back to the definition that you read in the very beginning that we are bringing together our two purposes yeah. under one together I, I remember when we were dating um and we were engaged to be married remember those times that god had us separate from each other like there were periods of time when he was just like you know what i need to get you alone because there's some things in us or in me that needed to come out uh in order for this union to work and i think you know if we take the time in our dating relationship to get along with God, to become who we're supposed to be, uh, getting rid of those sins, those idiosyncrasies, those things that can potentially damage the relationship, it prepares us for the, the marriage and the agreement and the commitment that we're making. But to your point, we come in with all of this stuff, trying to figure things out after we say I do, when there was a purpose and a time to do it prior to. Absolutely, and I think about even during that time, yes, I do remember those moments where we had to separate. And also, I remember before there was a Hassani, I was separate and I had to be alone with God. And that's that time where there's an opportunity to shape and mold you to submit to something higher than yourself. I think that's a big part that is skipped when people get together in marriage. They never actually had a time to submit to God, to humble themselves. It's kind of like, it's me, it's about me, it's me myself and I and I'm gonna be honored and I'm gonna be praised in this relationship and they're getting married to someone that adores them and all they're used to is being praised and, and exalted and so when you get married and reality hits that you have to become one and you have to become self-sacrificing and there's a lot of selflessness that has to take place and you've never done that it really makes it difficult Absolutely. for you to become one and to also join your purpose join your calling together to do something impactful in the world which leads us back to kingdom marriage absolutely and so going back to the wedding night once you said i do and actually got married you had to cut covenant and so the sexual union between a husband and a wife was similar to the sacrifice of an animal being killed right because there's a cutting tool which is the penis cut into the vagina the sexual union between that man and the woman after they've given their vows is a form is the covenant being established now it's important to know 
note that when we're talking about a covenant union, we're drawing a distinction between a covenant and a contract. You mentioned this earlier, that in the state, in this form of government, in this society, there's a marriage license, right? So there, in essence, is a contract. And when we have a contract mind uh, or, or minded focus in terms of what marriage is, then a contract, the unique difference is the contract is an agreement between a man and a woman, and we determine the conditions of that agreement. Whereas with a covenant, God determines the conditions. We don't have any say. We don't negotiate with God. We're honoring what he established. But it's, if it's you and me, then we're playing the role of God. So in a contract type of marriage, if you don't honor your part, then our relationship, our marriage, our agreement is null and void. So it's not till death do us part. It's the death of the marriage until you don't do something that I want you to do. All right. Well, there are all kinds of death. There's there's physical death, spiritual and emotional death. And a lot of times we cancel these contracts the moment we have an emotional death. When I don't feel you anymore, the marriage is over. And that is completely out of alignment. But I want to go to something that you were talking about that that I think is interesting. You know how important this covenant must be to God, um, how intricate and detailed it is. You know, the two coming together, the man and the woman being a virgin coming together in purity to make this covenant agreement with God. And you think think about how historically God has looked for a clean bloodline to bring his prophet, right? It had to be a clean bloodline, even that Jesus came to the world. Right. And so when we start talking about kingdom and the authority and the power, it is important for us to do it God's way. I mean, he destroyed the earth. He destroyed everything in it because all of mankind and the beast. Mm -hmm that were walking on the earth were corrupted. They were corrupted seed. I, I assume even the plants were corrupted. I mean, everything was corrupted mm -hmm. because everything had to go. And so if we think about it from those terms, we start recognizing how important his covenants are we can step up to the plate and be a voice. And, you know, for many of us out there, you might be saying something like, well, you know, I've been broke that covenant. It's too late for me. But maybe it's not too late for the next generation that needs a voice, that needs somebody to start speaking some sense and talking about these covenants and how important it is to God that somebody is upholding them so that he can do his work. He said we're supposed to establish, multiply, dominate in the earth. It is his footstep on the earth, his covenant. And if nobody is a holding it if nobody even understands what it means if there's no value in it if nobody sees relevancy in it then you're going to have something passing away and it's going to usher in a generation mm. of covenant breakers who are yeah. who are defiant to the way of god and now we got sodom and gomorrah all yeah. over again and so for those of you who have had sex for those of you who haven't done it god's way and now you've come into a relationship with him that's why we have jesus and we have this new covenant where he cleanses us from our past sins Absolutely. now we can enter into the promise of the covenant he didn't forget nothing did he? doing it his way right isn't that, isn't that exciting like it the is. fact that after all these covenants were established and broken like i mean if you go down all the dagnap covenants it's just like wow there was all these problems and all the covenants right but with jesus's covenant it is a continued promise that he will save us and he will wash us clean of our sins and we can and, and it re-establishes our connection back to the father wow. so so the covenant marriage are for those within the culture of the kingdom it, it really separates us from the rest of the world right so we can't necessarily promise that people who get married out of god's will will have all of these benefits and blessings but they're available to those who get married God's way. It's a promise, but it's conditional. It means that you have to do something. If you obey the laws of marriage, then you have access to all the promises that are a part of that covenant. But if you do not, you don't partake. And so that's motivation to do it God's way because who wants to be in a marriage that's broken? There's no peace. There's no joy. There's no love. There's no happiness. There's no, there's no unity. There's no connection. So many people have gone through that experience experience because they've done marriage wrong and now we can figure out how to do marriage right to not just be in god's purpose but have the benefits and the pleasures that come along with his intended purpose the big thing here is acknowledging understanding understanding these covenants is huge because you know there's a scripture that says heaven suffereth violence and the violent take it by force yes. and that just speaks to us having authority and knowledge 
and knowing what is rightfully ours. And we don't know because nobody is telling us, nobody's telling us all of the promises that are available to us uh, through this knowledge and through these covenants. And so you have to know, first of all, and then you can actually take authority over what's happening. So it's huge for us to be stepping into this conversation and kind of trying to dismantle these wrong backwards mental mm -hmm. constructs about what marriage is and what marriage isn't and kind of culminating all marriages as one if nobody's out here helping you to understand hey hey this right here this avenue this is what you this is the marriage you have an opportunity to step into yes there are other marriages and there are rules and there are laws that our governments have established that differs depending on what country you're in and i know we have people tuning in from all over the world but wherever you are you are an ambassador That's right. to Christ. It doesn't matter where you live. You can tap in to God's plan, his authority and his covenant for marriage. And, you know, to that point, the kingdom of God, it's the kingdom of all kingdoms, just like Jesus is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Like you have to understand, though you may be from Africa or Asia or Europe or the Americas, no matter what culture you are a part of, there's a there's a supernatural culture that once you come into relationship with him, you abide by other rules and other laws because you're ambassador of that kingdom. And so that's so critically important to understand. So marriage as a culture, God's way should look the same all over the world if we're subscribing to his culture. So guys, I hope you got something out of today's conversation about truly what a covenant union is within the realm of kingdom marriage. And listen, if you realize that you haven't done marriage right, you have an opportunity to make a change and to shift gears and to get in alignment with God's plan for your life and your marriage because it could be truly transformational from this day forward because not only does it impact you, the covenant, but it impacts your children and your children's children and generations to come. Remember, it's an everlasting covenant, which means it's supposed to last forever, forever, ever, forever, ever, forever. So guys, thanks for tuning in. And on our next episode, we'll go deeper into the definition of a kingdom marriage.